and we're going to be talking about mental health. Does your diet matter? And so right up front, I want you to give everybody, tell everybody who you are and why they should care what you think. Well, I am a traditionally trained MD. I went to University of Arizona for medical school after going uh, through George Washington University in DC to get my PA degree. So I worked as a physician assistant in cardiology for a number of years before going back to medical school. And the reason I went back was because I realized that I just wasn't going to be able to do the things I wanted to do within mainstream medicine unless I could really change the paradigm. What I saw was a lot of people being treated towards symptom resolution without being treated toward the root cause of their illness. And um, so I went back to medical school at the University of Arizona. And as you mentioned, I am now in the last few weeks of my residency at the University of uh, Washington here in Seattle in psychiatry. So it's a four year residency. As people may know, medical school and medicine is a long road. So you've got four years of medical school, then you've got four years of residency. And I'm in the last basically two weeks of my residency in psychiatry now, and I cannot wait to be done. I'm, um, I have uh, traditional training as an MD, and then I worked with Andrew Weil when I was at the University of Arizona. I'm certified as a functional medicine practitioner through the Institute of Functional Medicine, but recently, probably within the last year, I've you know, sort of branched off, as we'll talk about, into a lot of stuff into ketogenic and carnivore diets and really feel like um, a lot of the old school thinking, even within functional medicine community, uh, needs to continue to evolve. So that's who I am. Gotcha. And I can remember very well, Dr. Saladino, how slowly those last few days of residency go by. <laughs> it's, like, it's like one day is a week because you're just saying, because I, I had my calendar and I was marking off the days and I was like, holy crap, how long can a day possibly be? But the, the time really slows down in the last few weeks of your residency because I already had a, a situation set up waiting for me after residency. And it's like, this is never going to be over. I mean, these 14 days are going to last for 20 years. That is unfortunately the way it's kind of feeling for me right now. I just... I think that some of my colleagues in residency figured out a way to like take vacation at the very end. And that's the ultimate hack. You know, if you can take vacation at the end of your residency oh, yeah. and just, you know, just make the last month go away magically, it's fantastic because right now I just can't wait to be done. As people may know, I'm moving to San Diego to open a private practice there and get more into the sun and the surf. And so, yeah, I can't wait. It's, it's, I mean, I'm, trying to do as good as I can every day in residency. But as you know, man, mainstream Western medicine is not really good at allowing us to do the type of medicine that we should be doing. And when I see patients in clinical practice through residency, it's often very difficult for me because the system through the University of Washington, you know, one of the best universities in the country um, doesn't allow me to do functional medicine. It doesn't allow me to ask questions very well about what the root cause of a psychiatric or another illness is. And, you know, as you know, mainstream Western medicine thinks about problems in a very uh, balkanized way is one of my favorite words in a very isolated way. We don't think of the body as interconnected. Right. And so when someone comes to me, you know, with psychiatric illness, I want to know about their thyroid. I want to know about their gut. I want to know about their micronutrient status. I want to know about their genetics. I want to know about inflammation. And when I start doing that in residency, people are just like, what are you doing? Why are you ordering? Why are you ordering interleukin six on this guy? You know, and I think like, wow, I need to, I'm, I'm just done with residency. You know, I'm done. Like I need to be able to do this on my own. And I have a private practice on the side um, that I'll tell people about, but I mean, I have, you know, through my website, which is Paul Saladino MD, uh, dot com. I see patients privately on the side of my residency and do functional medicine stuff. And that allows me to do much more of the medicine I like to do. And with those patients, I can really dig into the root cause of whatever they're ha happening to have a problem with. And that's so much more satisfying because man, yeah. it is so heartbreaking when somebody mm -hmm. comes in and I think, I think I could help you, you know, I'm pretty sure we could fix this, but they're either, they're either not ready to make the change because they haven't found me in the right way or yeah. the system just limits me. You know, the system won't let me do stool testing on people or the system won't let me do micronutrient testing or the system doesn't let me, 
you know, people raise eyebrows when I want to order anti-thyroid antibodies, you know, it's crazy. So it's, <laughs> so a, it's a tough thing. And it, that's why would you, you're a psychiatrist. Yeah. You're a psychiatrist. Why do you want to know about their thyroid? What are you talking about? Oh my God. My years of practice as a family doctor kind of gives me a unique perspective on this because basically modern Western medicine trains young doctors. The, the question, the question is, which pill does this patient need? That, that's the question. There is no other question to answer. And so you might check labs and you might check imaging studies, but the only reason you're checking all of those things is to find out the answer to the ultimate question, which is yeah. which pill or which combination of pills does this patient need? And so really the only way a modern doctor can mess up is to give someone the wrong pill. And that's, that's literally it. So if you give them the correct pill or something that's approximates the correct pill, you're good. You did a good, you did a pretty good job, doc. That's a good job. And, and me as a family doctor, I get to wear many hats. And so if you come in with a knee effusion, I get to put on my orthopedic hat, right? And I get to drain that knee and inject some steroid and write you a prescription for whatever. If you come in with depression, I get to put on my psychiatry hat, a hat which I really enjoy wearing I, as I years and years went by in my practice. I found that I could really make a difference in people's mental health, not with the proper pill, but very often by weaning down the medications that they were on for psychiatric disorders and talking more and more, more and more about their diet first and foremost, but then also checking things like thyroid labs and adrenal labs and labs for inflammation. And then I could use that to say, hey, look, your body is globally inflamed. It's globally pissed off. And these pills are not going to fix that, but you actually could fix this. So do you want to talk about your diet today? Because that's actually very, very important. And, and Dr. Saladino already alluded to, many people aren't ready to hear that. They've been trained to think which pill is the right pill for me. In the U.S., you know, we can advertise prescription medications on television. And if you watch uh, primetime television, literally every other ad is an ad for a different patent pill uh, or a patent injection, right? And so they come to the doctor with only one question in mind, what is the pill that I should be taking or what is the injection I should be taking? And if you start to talk about things that aren't a pill or an injection, they immediately look at you like, what are you doing? I'm here for the, right, the proper pill. I'm not here to talk about the proper human diet. I wanna talk about the proper pill. Which pill should I take, doctor? And then that, that leaves doctors like me and Saladino going, yeah, you're not ready to hear. Come see me in three months or six months when you've done some more research. Then we can talk about what we can actually do to fix you. And so for those of you guys just joining us, I'm Dr. Ken Berry. This is Dr. Paul Saladino. We're both MDs. I'm board certified in family medicine. He'll soon be board eligible in psychiatry. If you're not already board eligible, I'm not sure how that uh, – it's been a few years since I've used the BEBC – terminology. I don't know where the cutoff is for that. But let's talk about mental health and what we both believe is the predominant mover behind uh, being, people being mentally unhealthy. I would say it's inflammation. So if we're thinking about um, psychiatric illness, right, we're thinking about depression and anxiety are the main things that people have. And there's things like Obsessive, obsessive compulsive disorder and psychotic disorders. But the majority of people that I see struggle with depression and anxiety. And I think that's probably, you know, 80, 90%. And yeah. mainstream psychiatry, like you said very well, wants to say, what is the right pill for you? And you're absolutely right. Like in residency, the way I am evaluated is whether or not I gave the patient the right combination of pills. And the biggest mistake I can make is giving someone the wrong pill or not giving them a pill at all. Yeah. Because there is this problem that if someone comes to see you and you don't give them a pill, you start to get questioned and people start to say like, well, are you sure you're doing this right? You know, like maybe yeah. you should be, you know, maybe you should be really giving them a pill. Uh, and you really have to justify this. But if you yeah. give someone a pill, immediately the pressure's off. Like you gave them a pill, so all is good. You know, it's such a crazy thing. And you're, you know, everyone watching this will have no subtle knowledge. It's not subtle knowledge. I mean, it's basically, we're told that the brain is broken. And this is the, this is the undercurrent that you and I were taught as physicians and that, that doctors that are being trained right now are trained in the paradigm mm -hmm. that 
the reason people are ill is because they, they have a pharmaceutical deficiency and they have a genetic problem. And, yep. you know, there's this fire from the gods in the pharmaceutical drugs that we use. And these are the only way we're going to fix it. You know, never in medical school was I told, hey, you might want to think about diet because there are movable, malleable factors in terms of people's diet and lifestyle, exposure to toxins, things like this, stress, inadequate sleep, that, that actually are at the root of the majority of the things that you're going to treat. I was never told that, but that has been my clinical experience after you know, a more than a decade in medicine between being a PA and being in medical school and being in residency. That's what I believe. And so it's, you know, people come to you and they've sort of been told that they expect you to, to give them a pill because in their mind, they've been sort of fed the same sort of paradigm. Hey, I'm broken. This is a genetic problem. Whether they're coming to see you for coronary artery disease or they're coming to see anyone for IBS or something, they are told I'm broken. It's a genetic thing. It's my bad luck. I got to hold a bad poker hand of life. I'm never going to be able to fix this. So yeah. the best thing I can do is a pharmaceutical, and I need to go see a special physician to give me a pharmaceutical. And, you know, in the psychiatry world, we're often told it's a neurotransmitter deficiency. And we're told it's not enough serotonin or it's, not, or it's too much dopamine in the case of psychotic disorders. But we're, you know, patients and physicians, even within residency, I mean, this blows my mind. I'm at the University of Washington, one of the best universities in the country. And throughout my residency, no one has ever talked about the fact that there is a mountain of literature, a mountain of literature that psychiatric illness is mostly brain inflammation. Yes. As a psychiatrist, <clears throat> through my training in psychiatry, I think of myself as a brain rheumatologist. I am a brain inflammologist, you know? It's inflammation. It in the brain. Yep, and, the, 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 and the problem with that statement that I just made is that I can't just think about the brain. I have to think about the, the, where the inflammation is coming from because the inflammation often doesn't start in the brain. And right. this is another thing that mainstream medicine, this is one of the lies that doctors tell us, just like yes. you have so well said. Like, this is one of the lies that we're told by physicians or the lies that we're told in the mainstream medical paradigm is that if there's a problem in an organ, the problem originated in that organ. If you have a problem with your thyroid, you go see a thyroid specialist. Nobody ever thinks, if you have a problem with your thyroid, maybe it's in your gut, you know? Absolutely. Or if you, have a, if you have a problem with your brain, maybe it's in your thyroid. Or if you have a problem with your brain, maybe it's in your biochemistry. The idea that a problem in the brain could originate outside of the brain is radical in psychiatry, and I don't know why. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you, you can quickly be, be judged as a quack, even by your peers, if you don't buy into the chemical imbalance hypothesis of depression and anxiety. And indeed, every commercial on television for an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication either states in, explicitly or implies that you have a chemical imbalance. It's not your fault. You have an imbalance in your brain. Our pill can fix that. And I know that you've looked into the research. And when Dr. Saladino says literature, he's talking about medical research. We call it literature. But <laughs> there, is a, there is no meaningful medical research that has ever proven that there is indeed a chemical imbalance in the brain of someone with clinical depression or clinical anxiety. Now, first and foremost, let's talk about a doctor's knee-jerk um, quickness to diagnose clinical depression and clinical anxiety that I think it's grossly overdiagnosed. And first of all, so let's say, for example, someone has got a, they're in a, they have a job that they hate and then one of their parents dies. It's normal for that person to be down in the dumps and sad and to cry or they lose a spouse. That's normal. It sucks, sucks bad. And it sucks for months and months and months. There is zero research that shows that if I put you on Lexapro or Zoloft or any of that crap, that it's going to help you grieve more appropriately or help you grieve more healthily. You're, you're grieving. You are in a state of mourning. That's not depression. There's, I mean, that is not depression. That is not anxiety. That is not any of those things. You don't need a pill for that. And the fact of the matter is no pill is going to help that. Now, there may be a pill that's going to numb you. Yeah. 
Um, you can do that with Jack Daniels, right? You can numb yourself with Jack Daniels. Does that mean you should drink a fifth every day if your spouse or your parent dies? Hell no, you shouldn't do that. That's a terrible way to deal with the grieving process. There's a process you have to go through, through to grieve, to grieve appropriately, and then to one day be able to, to, to move beyond the grief and actually have a normal life again and to look back on that loved one with happy thoughts. And not, Because if you stunt the grieving process with an SSRI or, or an SNRI or a, a benzodiazepine, you're not doing yourself any favors at all because you're going to be basically stuck in that grieving process forever. But I see so many doctors jump to diagnose. And then if you have a diagnosis, you got to have a pill, right? And, and so it, it's, it's so overdiagnosed, first of all. And then secondly, it's so overtreated because it's usually, it's an inflammatory process. And I think that's been shown multiple times, both in case studies that I've, I've seen in my office and you've seen in your practice. But then, so tell us, Doc, uh, tell us about the research that, that discovered these chemical imbalances. People, we, we put taps in their brain or in their spinal column, and we actually measured the serotonin and dopamine. <laughs> Is that how we did that? Talk about that. No. Because people really, truly think they have a chemical imbalance. This is known to medical science. We did the research and proved it, and here's the pill that's FDA approved for that. How, how was this research done? If, where did that concept even come from? You want to talk about that? Sure. I love what you said even before there about the diagnosis, and I can say a word about that too. I think depression is wildly overdiagnosed, and the problem in psychiatry is just the fact that our paradigm, our nosology, is, is based on qualitative, not quantitative data. So this is the problem and where I hope psychiatry will start to improve in the future is we don't have biological markers for depression. I think that in the future we'll get them. We'll be able to do spinal taps or we'll be able to do serological studies in the blood and see inflammatory markers or see indications that there's inflammation that may be connected with the brain. But it's really hard to sample this, right? Like this this actual part of the body is really hard to sample. You know, I can sample your blood and see what's going on with your thyroid, but it's hard to put something in here and see what's going on. And that's the problem for people is it's really hard to look in the brain and see what's going on. And so too often doctors are seeing people who are sad and saying you're depressed because it's almost just like a synonym. Of course, like that's a slam dunk diagnosis. Somebody's sad, therefore they're depressed. Therefore I give them an SSRI. And as you're saying, it doesn't work. It just blunts people. In fact, it changes their emotional state. It changes the way that they form new connections in their neurons in a negative way. Yes. What we actually see with serotonin is that we need serotonin to make new connections in the brain. And that, that by increasing the amount of serotonin in the synapse, which is what the drugs do, and I'll go into that, we may be making the, the neuronal collect connections more plastic, but that probably isn't what we want to do in the right way. And so we're we're definitely playing with fire with these medications. But, you know, the original monoamine hypothesis came from studies where they would just give people, you know, excess amounts of serotonergic drugs or take serotonin away from people, the serotonin depletion studies. And so it's quite a complex thing. Or tryptophan depletion studies. And so there's this, you know, there's this amino acid tryptophan, which we get in our diets, which is made into melatonin and serotonin. And so it's a lot of sort of, it's a lot of extrapolation to say that, oh, if you deprive someone of tryptophan and they don't make enough serotonin, they're not going to feel good. Yeah, that's probably true. But then the drug companies just jump on that and they say, hey, we, you know, we're going to give you a lot of serotonin and, and we're going to see what happens with you. And the problem, if you actually look at the research, as you said, there's never been a study that actually shows that people with depression consistently have lower levels of serotonin in their cerebrospinal fluid or in the neuronal synapse. It's obviously very difficult to assay the amount of serotonin yeah. in someone's synapse. And there so are a lot be, of things. Let's, let me interrupt you right there. Let's be very clear about that because I want people to hear this in as plain English as they possibly can. So you're telling me that all of the SSRIs out there that are FDA approved for depression, for anxiety, for social anxiety, you're telling me there's never been a single study done showing where the, they did a spinal tap and they measured the serotonin in the, in the, the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, 
or they tapped into their brain or they took a neuronal biopsy and said, look, their serotonin levels are super low in these neurons or the serotonin level in their cerebral spinal fluid is very, very low. We need to put them on something that's going to help them reuptake the serotonin back into the neuron. You're telling me, and I know you've poured over the psychiatry, medical research and literature for hours and hours as a psychiatry resident, you're telling me that there is no such research that has ever been done on human beings? No such research. In fact, we see the opposite. You know, if you look at the, I mean, they've tried, right? They've tried, they've done CSF studies, cerebrospinal fluid studies, and what they see is it's all over the board. Some people have low serotonin, some people have high serotonin. You can do serotonin depletion studies where you actually prevent people from making serotonin. Doesn't always make people depressed. Sometimes it does make people depressed. It's, it's, it's very variable. And so I, the other thing is I want people to understand what these drugs are doing. And like you mentioned, there are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are SSRIs. This is Prozac, Zoloft, things like this. Uh, Prozac, Zoloft, uh, Paxil. And then there are SNRIs, which are serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, things like Cymbalta and Venlafaxine, which is Effexor. And then there are dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, which are things like Welbutrin, or bupropion. And so those are the main medications that we use. There are other medications that are similar, but all of these medications are changing the way we move neurotransmitters from the synapse, which is between two neurons, back into one neuron. And what they do is they generally do reuptake inhibition, meaning that they're just inhibiting a transporter that's taking the neurotransmitter out of the synapse. So they're just putting more neurotransmitter in the synapse. That's the way these medications work. Now, that like you're so elegantly pointing out that would make a ton of sense if for some reason there was a dopamine norepinephrine or serotonin deficiency right right but there's not there's not there's not a deficiency of these neurotransmitters in the synapse and the other thing that we see with these medications and all the physicians that prescribe them should be talking to people about this the other thing we see is that when you give someone an ssri an snri or a dnri so you give them Prozac, or you give them venlafaxine, or Effexor, or you give them Welbutrin, you don't see the effects right away in most people. And as you know, you'll see on the package insert, and most people have probably been told by their physician, you need to give it four to six weeks. Well, pharmacologically, we know that the inhibition of the reuptake pump uh, in, in the neuronal synapse happens immediately. It happens within an hour. So the amount of serotonin in, in the synapse, the amount of norepinephrine in the synapse, or the amount of dopamine in the synapse changes within one hour of taking this medication. But clinically, we can talk about the studies that have been done regarding the efficacy of these medications, which are a whole different set of, which is a whole different set of literature. But a lot of people, in the people that actually respond to these medications, which is a very small proportion, they, they don't respond for four to six weeks, suggesting that if these medications work, and I do believe they work in some people, and we can talk about why, but they're not actually correcting the root cause. It's like anything else, right? It's like, I can give you, I can give someone ibuprofen and that's going, to, that's going to improve the pain. But is that what we want to be doing? And is that treating the root cause? Absolutely. And, so, and so these medications, and this is the whole controversy, do SSRIs work? They do work in some people and I have seen them work and I will not deny they work in some people. As you mentioned, the depression diagnosis is very nuanced and I think it's done incorrectly in many people and these medications are number one, overprescribed. Number two, in the people that it does work, it takes a while, it takes four to six weeks, suggesting that the mechanism has nothing to do with the amount of serotonin in the synapse. It may have to do with other things having, you know, connected with that, which we can talk about. But in terms of the efficacy of these medications, the trial is called STAR-D. And there have been multiple reappraisals and reanalysis of STAR-D. But if you look at the STAR-D trial with antidepressants, what they generally find is that only about 30 to 40% of people respond. Well, how many people responded to placebo? About 25 to 30% responded to placebo. So the actual statistically significant divergence of response to antidepressant medications, there was no statistically significant divergence until you had at least moderate or severe depression. So in people with mild to moderate depression in the STARDI trial, there's it basically the antidepressants look like placebo. And this is the idea, like 
very few people respond to these medications. Once you get to severe depression, there, there is a statistically significant divergence in the response to these medications. But at mild and moderate, it's very weak. And so there's something else going on here. A lot of times people get a placebo effect from these medications, and this is what we call the active placebo effect, et cetera. Yeah. But the underlying question that we need to be asking is, what is actually causing anxiety? What is actually causing yeah. depression? And yes. like you said, there's never been a study to show it's low serotonin. It's something else. And, and in fact, as we can get into, there have been studies that show that in people with depression, there are elevated levels of cytokines in yes. the CSF, <clears throat> in the cerebrospinal fluid. So and what has been shown? That, doc. Let's dive yeah. into what is actually causing, what we believe is causing the, the depression, anxiety, OCD, and other psychiatric diagnosis. But first, let me ask you a question. A lot of my people on my page love to share these videos on their page or in their groups. Do, can, and I always uh, ask my guests permission. Do you mind if people share this video on their personal profile or on their page or on, in their groups? Is that okay with you? Mm -hmm. Totally fine. Totally fine. Okay. All right. So you guys, if you want to share this on your page, if you've got a friend or a relative who needs to hear this, but you can't be like, hey, you need to watch this, then definitely share this in a group that they're in, share it. Uh, and you can also send it in an email multiple different ways. But you have our permission to share this. And if you do share it, type share it in the comments so we can thank you for that. Now, Dr. Paul Saladino, who's almost finished his training in psychiatry, he's got a couple of weeks left, which uh, translates into about 15 years. That's how it feels on his end. I very <laughs> well. uh, tell us, what do you believe is the root cause of, of the clinical, I mean, for people who are cl properly clinically diagnosed with depression, anxiety, uh, OCD, all of the, the spectrum of bipolar, which I also think is something else that's grossly overdiagnosed by primary care. Especially. Oh, yes. Yeah, big time, because it sounds much sexier than, oh, you've got depression. Oh, you've got bipolar, and there's all these different variants of that. What do you think is the root cause behind all of this mental disease that we see in the U.S. and indeed the world today that you just didn't see at all 50 or 100 years ago? What's going on? It's brain inflammation. So it's essentially like having rheumatoid arthritis in your brain. You know, it's like having lupus in your brain. It's like having any inflammatory disease in your brain or any autoimmune disease in your brain. I think you could pretty accurately characterize psychiatric disease as an autoimmune condition in the brain. And I think that autoimmunity and inflammation are essentially synonymous. Um, and so what we see here, and you made this excellent point, which I'll just reiterate to people, I don't think all psychiatric disease is inflammatory. And I don't want to invalidate people who are struggling psychiatrically or psychologically 100% agree. 100% in who are having stressful things in their life. I think that there are people who have stressful occurrences in their life. You lose your job, you have a divorce, something happens to your child. That is a real psychiatric disease, but that is probably not a psychiatric disease that is brain inflammation. Okay. That is your life is really freaking hard right now. Psychiatric disease. Okay. Yeah. But I think I this is, the way we say that in Tennessee, when I'm actually in clinic with patients, I'll say, yeah, it sucks and it's going to suck, but there ain't no pill for that. You just right. got to go through it. You got to grieve it out. You got to cry it out. You got to throw shit and, and cuss and yell and cry some more. That's what's ultimately going to make this okay. There ain't no pill for that. Yeah, there's no pill for grief. There's no pill for, you know, I'm getting divorced. There's no pill for I lost my job. There's no pill for I'm really stressed. It's, it's lifestyle stuff. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people come to their doctor with psychiatric disease that is actually inflammatory. And these are the people who can look at their life and say, I am really anxious for no reason. You know, I really am depressed for no reason. They can say, you know what? Yeah. And, and the two can coexist and they can overlap. And that's what makes yeah. psychiatry so complicated. But generally what I like to ask people is, how are things going in your life? And the biggest litmus test is people say like, you know what? It's okay. Like I have a spouse, they're caring. I have kids, they're healthy. I have a job. I don't hate it. My boss isn't a jerk, you know, but you know what? I'm just depressed and I don't have anything that gets me out of bed in the morning. And those are people who are, they can also say like, you know what? I've had depression throughout my life. Even when my life has been great, I've been depressed. And these are people who have, you know, up and down moods throughout their life, no matter what's going on. 
But the person who comes to me and says, you know what, I've had a great life, I've always been happy, and now my spouse died, or I got cancer, or I lost my job and I love that job, and now I'm really depressed. I think maybe this is not brain inflammation. So this is the thing is, and those are the kind of people like you're saying that probably don't need an SSRI. They probably just need therapy. They need somebody to talk to and you know, they need a therapist or they need psychiatric you know, psychotherapy. Yeah. So another, that's what those, yeah. Another big thing I see in that population, and this is something that is really a pet peeve for me, is that, okay, so you go to your primary care doctor and you're that person you were just describing. I'm always down. My life is pretty decent. I got a great job. I make good money. I got a great spouse. Everything's good in my life, but I'm just down in the dumps all the time. The average primary care doctor is going to put them on Lexapro, Zoloft, Effects, or Prozac, Paxil, and they're not going to check any lab work. What the hell? Okay. So if everybody listening, if you were diagnosed with depression and there wasn't a big panel of blood work drawn on you, big. You, were, you were inappropriately diagnosed. You need to go yeah. back to your doctor and say, hey, doc, I was Googling and I found that, that one of the main symptoms of, of uh, hypothyroidism can be depression. So why didn't you check my thyroid labs? Or, hey, doc, I, I read that adrenal uh, problems can can one of the main symptoms that can surface is depression but you didn't check my adrenal glands did you but uh, and also I'm a, I'm a 55 year old guy or I'm a 60 year old woman and I read that if my my gender hormones have bottomed out one of the main symptoms is depression how come you didn't check my testosterone doctor there should be a, I, I mean before I diagnose somebody as clinically depressed there's levels of lab work that I will check on them before I'll say, yeah, so really diagnose, uh, diagnosing somebody with depression should be a diagnosis of exclusion on multiple levels. First of all, you haven't had a huge loss in your life. That, that's the first level. That's what Dr. Saladino was talking about. Secondly, I have ruled out hypothyroidism, thyroiditis. I've ruled out all the adrenal maladies that can exist. I've ruled out fibromyalgia. I've ruled out menopause or menopause or all the other hundreds of medical conditions that can mimic depression. And I've actually got a YouTube video on this about all the labs you need to have checked if you've been diagnosed with depression. And so if your doctor diagnosed you with depression and prescribed you a medication, but there was no lab work involved, you, you, were, you were short cheated, I'm sorry, but that's not how it's supposed to be done. And I think Dr. Saladino as a board eligible psychiatrist would agree with that, but I bet you money many of your colleagues don't ever order labs, do they? It's meager and it's almost never done. And they'll, it's not for lack of them being super smart or really well intentioned. It's right, just right. the fact that they, that we are not taught this way. And hopefully, you know, you and I can continue to be a part of changing this paradigm, especially for the education of physicians. And I think that what's going to happen is that a lot of people watching this are going to educate their doctors. And so I think that physicians are going to get educated yep. by their patients, which is awesome. Yes. It's, it's often a little challenging for physicians when that happens. But I think that that's what's going to happen in the future is that people are going to start to ask these questions of their physicians. They're going to read your book. Hopefully they'll see my stuff and they'll say, doc, I don't think we're doing enough. Can we do more? And their doctor's going to go, okay, you're blowing my mind right now, but I'm willing to learn. But it's not because the docs are bad docs. It's just because they're not taught the right way. And there's so much more that, that's being left out. But it happens. Absolutely. It's very rare. It's very rare. And like I said, within my residency, I'm going to throw UW under the bus right now and hope that, you know, it's, I'm tough love for University of Washington right now. In my residency, when I've tried to do extensive workups on people, I get pushed back. Yep. You know, people say, why are you doing a gut test on this person? Why are you checking their stool? You know, why are you checking an HSCRP? I've ordered HSCRP, which is the most basic of inflammatory markers and probably actually not sensitive enough for people. I've ordered that on people and I've had attendings cancel that lab saying they don't need an HSCRP. And I just like fall out of my chair and go, all right, whatever. When I get done with residents, like I'm gonna, in my private clients, I'm going to do this. So let's dig in. Let's dig into like what actually causes this, because I think people probably want to know this. Yes. So like I said, I see if if someone comes to me and they have what I would consider to be endogenous depression, not exogenous depression. Exogenous depression is your life sucks depression. Right. And that is real. 
And the way to treat that is family, community, sleep, you know, going back, maybe seeing a therapist. Endogenous depression is organic depression. It's my biochemistry is working against me. And I think of that as an autoimmune brain thing. And that's just not something I'm making up. There's evidence that we see in that. And so there are plenty of studies that I can link to on my page and I'll talk about on my social media. And what we can do is we have looked at, like you were saying, we've actually looked at the cerebrospinal fluid of people with depression, people who have attempted suicide, people who have completed suicide. And what we see is that two cytokines are particularly elevated, well, three, but the main two cytokines that we see elevated in the cerebrospinal fluid of people with depression and anxiety are TNF-alpha and interleukin-6, and HSCRP sometimes in the serum. So those are the three, but it's pretty hard to measure interleukin-6 in the CSF, and it's pretty hard to measure TNF-alpha in the CSF. One of the things that I've talked about with my colleagues here is I think that psychiatrists should be doing, you know, spinal taps. I think we should be doing CSF assay. And the, the problem is that that's not easy. And, it, you know, when you puncture the dura and you puncture the into the cerebrospinal space, people can get bleeding and they can get, they can get bad side effects. So it's hard to know. But if there were a way, if unfortunately the body is not designed in a convenient way to sample the cerebrospinal fluid, but if there were a way, we would be doing that. And so we have to use the blood as a proxy. Unfortunately, the blood is not the best proxy. When they look at serologic studies, there are serologic studies which suggest that there are cytokines elevated in the serum, but it's a little bit harder to make the correlation. And so basically what we're seeing is inflammation, which probably doesn't start in the brain. It's pretty rare for inflammation to start in the brain unless you have a tumor you know, heaven forbid, unless you have a tumor in the brain or a bacterial infection in the brain, which is very rare, or a viral infection in the brain, like, you know, herpes in the brain or herpes, you know, temporal, you know, inflammation in the brain, uh, encephalitis, then you usually don't have inflammation in the brain as a primary thing. And again, this challenges the notion in Western medicine. If you have inflammation in the brain, it's probably coming from outside of the brain. <laughs> and what happens is you have something else in your body which is causing your body to have an immunologic reaction, which is triggering your immune system. And then the immune system sees an antigen, whether it's an antigen presenting cell, like a macrophage, or it's a T cell, or it's a B cell. And it's saying, whoa, sound the alarm. And it creates a cytokine milieu. It creates a cytokine signal throughout the body. Cytokines are like text messages that different parts of the immune system send to each other. They're signals that are happening in your body that can give us a sense of the temperature, not literally, but sort of the attitude of your immune system. And so I think that in the future, more and more precise assays of the cytokines are what's gonna get us to better definition of psychiatric illness. There are some companies now through which you can look at cytokines in humans. Uh, it's a little bit difficult and it's not refined, but I think that that's the way to do it. But we can also use our clinical judgment and like you're saying, if you look, and I love what you're saying, I think that if someone is diagnosed with depression, the job of the physician is to look outside of the brain at the places the inflammation could be coming from or the imbalance, right? So you mentioned thyroid. I absolutely think thyroid is a huge thing. And thyroid, can, there can be inflammatory things which cause a thyroid issue. There can be non-inflammatory things which cause a thyroid issue. But I think for most people... <clears throat> It's going to be an autoimmune thyroid thing. It's going to be autoimmune thyroiditis, which we, cause, which we call Hashimoto's, or it could even be autoimmune thyroiditis causing a hyperthyroidism condition like a Graves' disease. So, but there can be autoimmune inflammatory things which change your thyroid. There can be adrenal issues as well, which can be related to stress and sleep and inadequate nutrition. I just posted on my Instagram and I sent out my newsletter, the Fundamental Health Newsletter, and I talked about the fact that a lot of people when they do ketogenic diets, and I'm sure you've talked about this, a lot of people when they do ketogenic diets don't get enough salt. And all of, all of this literature saying that cortisol rises or stress hormones spike on ketogenic diets are hinged on the fact that those studies were done in metabolic wards where people were actually sodium limited. And so if people are doing ketogenic or carnivore diets and they're not getting enough salt, they could really be spiking their cortisol. And as you know, that can throw off all your hormones. That can throw off testosterone. That can cause stress. That can cause all sorts of issues. So that's another thing you could look at. 
Other sources of inflammation for me are the gut. And this is a big one, right? The gut is actually outside of the human body. We're just like a donut. You know, we have mouth to anus and who knows what's going on in there. But I think that so much inflammation starts in the gut. And that's where all of our immune system is. The majority of it is right around the gut, right below that first layer of the gut. You get that lamina propria. You get all these immune cells hanging out there. And all these antigens from our diets can be triggering leaky gut. There's some great work by Alessio Fasano at MGH with this molecule zonulin and showing that when we eat things, and there are a number of foods which can trigger leaky gut, the major ones are gluten, alcohol, uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. But I'm beginning to really believe that in many people, there are a myriad of things which can trigger the release of this molecule called zonulin. And when zonulin gets released, all of these occludin and adherin junctions that bind the cells of the gut lining go back and they, they fall apart. The gut gets leaky. And what do you think happens then? All these antigens from the gut, all this food matter, all these signals just rain on the immune system, you know? And the immune system goes, oh my gosh, it just freaks out. Yep. And what you can, and we know this happens, you know? There's a great talk from Alessio Fasano that I've heard where he says that we can actually look at immune cells and we can look at markers on the immune cells and see where they originated. And when we do studies with people who have multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune condition in the brain, we can see that those immune cells, which are pulling the myelin sheath off the neurons in multiple sclerosis in the brain, where did they originate? They originated in the gut. They yep. originated in the gut. And the other thing we can see is people who have type one diabetes with pancreatic issues, right? Their pancreas is getting attacked by the immune system. Those immune cells originated in the gut. So what we see is immune cells moving to parts of the body from the gut very, very often. And so I think what's going on in psychiatric illness for people that have this brain inflammatory condition is something is triggering inflammation. It could also be like you're suggesting hormonal imbalances, which are usually connected with inflammation in the first place. If you trace it back and back and back, you know, but what we can actually see in the brains of people with depression, and this is some of the most fascinating stuff, is we see brain immune cells turned on. Yes. And the immune, the immune cell that we're talking about is a microglial cell. And microglial cell is a brain-derived macrophage. And so macrophages are one of the key components of our innate immune system. These are like the policemen that are always circulating in the human body. We have these two immune systems. One of the immune system is like the National Guard. It gets called out during times of emergencies. That's the adaptive immune system. That's like T cells and B cells. But we have this innate immune system, and the innate immune system are things like macrophages. Those are like policemen. They're always on patrol. And so these immune cells that are patrolling the brain all the time are called microglial cells. And we can very clearly see microglial cells getting turned on. Microglial cells have this thing they do. They switch from an M1 to an M2 phenotype, meaning they basically get turned on. It's like the policemen in your brain go on duty from off duty, right? They're like, yeah. the policemen are hanging out at home with their families, and then they get the call, and they go, oh, my pager's going off. I got to go out in my squad car. So we get the macrophages in the brain, the microglial cells, they're getting called to action, or the fire department, right? Fire department's hanging out at the fire station. They're turned off. That's one microglial cell phenotype. The alarm goes off. They go down the pole. They freak out. They go out in the, the fire engine. Sirens are on. That's the activated microglial cell phenotype. And we see that in people with depression and anxiety and OCD. And like you're saying, bipolar, we yep. see brain, we see the fire department in the brain. We see the police department in the brain running around with all the sirens on. So it begs the question, why are we treating something? Why are we just trying to increase neurotransmitters when the, the, when the fire departments, you know, like running around and the police are running around? I mean, if you're in a city and the police department's running around and there's a siren and the fire department's running around, there's a siren, you think, well, I hope they catch that criminal or I hope they put that fire out. And that's what we should be doing as physicians. And that's what patients need to be helping their doctors understand is you got to put the fire out. You know, you got to yeah. help that policeman catch the, the criminal. And sometimes the criminal is outside of the brain, often outside right. of the brain. Very often outside the brain. So if someone listening to this live, first of all, let me say, I'm a doctor, and Dr. Saladino is a doctor, but today we ain't yo doctor, okay? This is not medical advice. 
This is just two doctors <laughs> talking about what, what they think is going on both inside and outside of the human brain, right? So definitely I want you to listen to this. I want you to do more research. I want you to go and talk to your doctor about this and maybe ask for some lab work and maybe start to think about your diet. So Dr. Saladino, if someone's listening to this and they're like, okay, I'm ready. I, I, I totally get what you're saying. I'm ready to, uh, and I want to, I want to start to fix my depression, anxiety, PTSD, ADD, OCD. I want to try to fix it. What would you suggest? What are the first basic steps? If we think of our diet, our diet in the terms of knobs, what should I turn down? What should I turn up? to try to start to, 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 to work on the inflammation that seems to be going on inside my brain. Well, I think that you're absolutely right. The diet is the first lever, right? I talk about this with my patients, knobs and levers, and what do you pull in and what's the thing? And diet is definitely the first lever that I would pull. Um, one of the first, you know, I think that diet is hard for people to change, but I think that it's crucial. Diet is a big lever. Diet is like this huge lever. You have to have two hands and pull this lever down, right? So the other levers you should be pulling are sleep, community, you know, toxic relationships. If you got to have sleep, you got to have some exercise. But when you want to pull the diet thing down, I think that we can go in tiers and I'll walk people through it from my perspective. And you can let me know if you agree with this. I think the first thing with diet is get rid of the processed foods. And I'm sure the majority of people listening to this, they're not listening to this podcast while they're drinking a Coke, you know, but you got the way I think of it is tears like a ladder. You know, the first step yeah. of the ladder is get rid of the processed food. That means anything with a label, anything that comes in a can, like you got to get rid of the processed yeah. food. That's the first step. Eat whole foods. Now, as you go to the next step, I would say you have to eliminate the non paleo foods. And there's, there's about five steps on this ladder. So I think the next step for people is eliminating things like grains and beans and often dairy for people, I think, can be an offender for people that are sensitive. So I like paleo as the second step. And if people aren't familiar with paleo, it's basically a, an idea that we're trying to mimic what we were doing evolutionarily. As we'll see when we get to this, the last step, I think that there's more to our evolutionary heritage than just eliminating grains and beans. But I think eliminating wheat, eliminating grains like rice and oats and beans, which are very offensive to us from a lectin's perspective, is a huge thing and eliminating dairy. So basically, if you get to a paleo diet, in my opinion, you're on the second or third rung of that ladder. You're starting to really climb, and a lot of people do really good there. The next rung of the ladder might be something like autoimmune paleo, which is just getting a little more granular with even, because this starts to introduce the notion that even within the paleo movement, there are vegetables that can trigger us immunologically. Things like nightshade vegetables or you know, even nuts and seeds, though they're technically paleo, I think that they can trigger us almost to the same extent that grains and beans can. So Absolutely. then you might go, then you might go autoimmune paleo. And then I think the next step is to play with carbohydrates and to really go to a ketogenic low carbohydrate diet. And at this point, you're about five rungs up the ladder. So if you're doing that, you really need to pat yourself on the back and be like, you know what, you are working super hard. You are doing awesome. And this is the stuff you've talked about so much. And I know you've been an advocate for ketogenic diets for years and have helped so many people. But this is the idea that our bodies can run on carbohydrate or fat. And there are so many advantages to fat-based metabolism that even within a paleo diet, people can be getting a lot of carbohydrates. And I think that most people, if not all people, are going to do much better when they cut out the carbohydrates or cut them way down. Yeah. So you could do like a ketogenic diet, which is going to change your physiology in so many great ways. And it's going to change the way your immune system works. It's going to change the way your genes are transcribed. I've talked about it in other podcasts that I've been on, but we know that the presence of ketones, specifically beta hydroxybutyrate, actually turns on longevity genes. And yeah. all the buzz right now is this buzz about caloric restriction and the benefits of caloric restriction mm -hmm. and all these fancy molecules which mimic caloric restriction, but as you and I have talked about, they're actually just fairy tales. They don't really do it that well. Ketones mimic caloric restriction. You get all the benefits of caloric restriction when you're in ketosis. So from an autophagy perspective, from a longevity perspective, there's keto. And I think that the last rung of the ladder is a carnivore diet, is a nose to tail carnivore diet. And this is something that I've gotten into in the last year. You and I talked about it on the recent podcast that we did on my podcast, which is Fundamental Health with Paul Saladino, MD. 
And so we talked about the fact that some people, I think a lot of people actually, get triggered by a lot of plants. A lot of plants can be triggering for people. Not even, not, I mean, some people get triggered by, you know, things that people would consider to be benign, like broccoli. Absolutely. Yeah. And as we have talked about, there are lots of toxins in plants beyond, you know, the, the major ones we're talking about. So we talked about grains and beans, get rid of those, nuts and seeds and dairy. But even once you get rid of those, there are so many toxins in plants, whether it's oxalates or other lectins or other plant defense molecules, which are called phytoalexins, like tannins are actually phytoalexins, and a lot of polyphenolic molecules, which we've been told by the mainstream media are, are beneficial for us, are actually plant defense molecules that if you look hard enough are hurting us. So I really think that the, the ultimate, like the last step on the ladder is understanding that a nose to tail carnivore diet is going to give us the most basic, most primal, like most fundamental nutrition. And I believe that if you're eating nose to tail, you can get all the nutrients that a human needs to function optimally without any of the toxins down in plants. Yeah. And so for some people, if somebody goes to keto and they're not finding full resolution of whatever symptom, I think carnivore is the next step. Yeah, and I, I think totally that once people, once people go to carnivore, they can back off and try and introduce plants if they want. There are people who tolerate some plants, that's true. But there are definitely hundreds and hundreds of people in the carnivore community, probably thousands and thousands now, who really find that, you know what? They feel better without any plants. And this yeah. is the crazy thing. If people are interested in this, they can look at more of both of our works. There's really nothing in plants that we need to get. There's nothing in plants that you can't get in animals. And I would argue there is plenty in animals that you can't get in plants. And this really flies in the face of the notion that you need these special magical molecules. We talked about it yesterday. We were talking about phytochemicals or phytonutrients. And you suggested that we term this new thing zoonutrients, you know? And I think yeah. it's true. Like, there, in my opinion, there's no such thing as a unique phytonutrient. And this is supported by the science. I'm not just making this up. There's really nothing in plants that we cannot get in animals that humans need to function optimally. So right. if, you eat, if you eat an osteo carnivore diet, you're just basically, you're hacking the matrix, right? You're saying this is the ultimate diet for a human. It's the simplest diet and there's no plant toxins. Now, having said that, if people want to reincorporate plants to see what they tolerate, that's fine. I get it. Some people do tolerate some, but I love the idea more and more of a carnivore cleanse or a carnivore period for people yes. so that they can see how they feel on a carnivore diet. And if you get, and I'm sure you do this with your patients, I do it with my patients very often, I'll have them go nose to tail carnivore, which means eating the organs and the muscle meat, not just the muscle meat. We're not talking about a ribeye diet here. If they go nose to tail carnivore. And then what you want is you want to see the symptoms resolve. And once you get to resolution of symptoms, you're like, ah, we, we did it. And then they can add back plants as they want for social or entertainment or whatever kind of reasons. But some people don't ever end up adding plants back. And, you know, we've both been carnivores for about a year now. So, like, I don't need any plants and I don't miss them at all now. Yeah. And so if, if you're watching this video right now because someone shared it with you and you're currently eating the standard American diet or what I call the stupid American diet, or if you're in another country, we could call this the standard Western diet then what are the basic steps? How do we go from eating a standard American or standard Western diet to eating a diet that, that Dr. Saladino and I think is much more ancestrally appropriate? And I like to talk about it in steps. Step one is to get rid of all sugars whatsoever, including locally grown honey and organic agave nectar. No sugar is good for you. There is no such thing as an essential sugar. If you never ate sugar again for the rest of your life, you would be fine. You would actually be really fine because you don't need them. They just drag down your system. Step two is to get rid of all grains, wheat, rice, oats, corn, rye, millet, quinoa, amaranth. None of these are good for you. There is nothing in them. There's not a single phytonutrient in any grain. I don't care what they tell you. You don't need grains whatsoever. Now, if you're starving to death, yeah, grains are much preferable to starving. But if you'd like to optimize your health and optimize your body and optimize your mental health, stop all grains. Step three is to remove all industrial seed oils from your diet. This is canola. This is corn oil. This is peanut oil. This is soybean oil, safflower, sunflower, grapeseed oil. None of these things are naturally oily. 
you have to put them through, they have to go to a factory and be submitted to all kinds of chemicals and deodorants and, 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 and all kinds of crap. You don't need in your body. So that's step three. Step four for most people, and some people after those three steps, doc, they're like, hey, I feel great. And that's probably fine for them at that point in their journey. Some people need to go ahead to step four, which is to get rid of all the beans and all the peas. And so keep in mind what Dr. Saladino said, plants have defenses to keep you from eating them. If you go out in the wild and you try to eat a water buffalo, he's going to kick you in the face and fracture your skull and mandible. Then you won't eat him. That's his defense mechanism, right? Plants can't do that. So they actually put toxins in their seeds. They put poisons in their seeds and in their beans and in, their, in, in all that stuff so that if you eat them, it's not going to kill you immediately unless it's, you know, water hemlock or ricin or something or castor beans. Yeah, that might kill you immediately. Most plants put slow poisons in their, in their seeds. And so they cause inflammation in your gut which then leads to inflammation in your joints and even in your brain, as we alluded to. There you go. <laughs> you're sitting around depressed all day. You're not going to eat them anymore. You're going to figure out, oh, I need to avoid that plant. For some people, they need to go to the next step. I, have to, I had to do this step, and that's to eliminate all the nightshades, tomatoes, peppers, tomatillos, eggplants, all of which I freaking love. But I, if I eat them, I immediately start to notice inflammation in my gut and in my joints. And if I ate enough of them, that inflammation would eventually make it to my brain. And so some people, and after those five steps, they're like, boom, I feel better than I've felt in years. This is amazing. Some people, however, have to keep turning down the carbohydrate knob. And so we hear a lot in the keto space, oh, you need seven to 10 cups of vegetables a day. I don't believe that at all. I think that's dumb advice. Most people don't need any vegetables a day. If you like them and want to eat them, for some people, I think that's fine. But most people, as they continue to turn down the carbohydrate knob and approach zero carbohydrates a day, that's when they feel their best. And when you turn the carbohydrate knob all the way down, that is the carnivore diet, which I consider a subset of a ketogenic diet. And some people have to go that far to reclaim either their physical health or their medical, medical health. Now, we're going to have to wrap it up here, Doc, because people have jobs and lives. They can't listen to us all day. So <laughs> but we can talk all day. If they, if they want to dive deeper into your work, where can they find you? And what are we going to do next? So if people want to find me, the best place to start right now is my website, which is paulsaladinomd.com. My last name, the greatest irony is that my last name has salad in it. So S-A-L-A-D-I-N-O. But it also has dinosaur, or at least dino in it. So I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize the dino rather than the salad. So S-A-L-A-D-I-N-O, paulsaladinomd.com. They can sign up for my newsletter there. There's a page for the newsletter. I have a podcast. It is called Fundamental Health with Paul Saladino, MD. We released our episode. I interviewed Dr. Ken Berry last week. It's getting all sorts of great attention right now. We had an awesome interview. So if you guys want to see more of Ken Berry, you can see him on my podcast, which is Fundamental Health with Paul Saladino, MD. I am on Instagram at Paul Saladino, MD. I have my own YouTube channel under my name, which is Paul Saladino, MD. I'm on Twitter at MD Saladino, and I'm on Facebook at Paul Saladino, MD. Uh, so those are all my outlets. People can find me at all those places, but check out. Oh, I don't know. Did he lock up? Oh, I think Dr. Saladino locked up. So guys, you, you have our permission to share this. You can share this anywhere on social media. If you know someone, it might help because so many people think they have a chemical imbalance in their brain and they don't. They have either too many carbohydrates in their diet, their insulin level is chronically too high, or they have too much inflammation. Almost without exception, that's what's leading to their mental issue. And so that was Dr. Paul Saladino. I'm so happy I could share this information with you guys. All this stuff is linked. All this stuff, uh, Nisha is going to link in the show notes everything we've been talking about here. Thanks so much for joining me. And it, like Dr. Saladino said, so many times, What's going to happen is a doctor's not going to know any of this stuff, and you're going to have to educate your doctor. It's not your job. It's not your fault, but it is your problem. This is Dr. Barry. I'll see you next time.